Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. Welcome back to Projections, our weekly show about virtual reality and augmented reality. More augmented reality this week than normal. Yes, I know, very exciting. Last week, you and I went to the Augmented World Expo. Yeah, our first time there. This is not too far from us, an expo that's been going on for a few years now in Santa Clara. And man, was it packed. It was so bustling with people, with booths, with hardware. We were completely surprised by how yeah. much enthusiasm there was for augmented reality technologies, not just headsets, but ways to track the world, experiments in input, experiments in UI, experiments yeah. in video capture, uh, and we had a lot of fun there. We're only six years into this thing. I mean, six years ago, Palmer was on a forum called Meant to be Seen in 3D with this crazy idea about a VR headset made with duct tape. Here we are, this expo was packed. I mean, there were lines to see headsets. Right, Microsoft was there showing off their mixed reality headset, and uh, other AR, more established AR companies like Meta was there showing off their headset. Yep. But one headset that we got to see, which is a hybrid VR and AR headset, is something unlike anything we've seen before. It's from a company called Vario, and they're uh, founded by a bunch of engineers that used to work at Nokia, the right. phone company. So they're in, uh, in Helsinki, Finland, Yep. and they have made something I would say is truly special. This is beyond anything I expected to see this year. It was a prototype of a not consumer facing headset. This is meant for the professional business, but their headset has how many displays, Jeremy? <laughs> well, I would normally say two because it is it, it is two, but it's two per eye. Two per eye. I, now this is, this is pretty cool. So you, most of your field of view is filled by a panel that is the same resolution as the Vive Pro. Yeah, 1440 by 1600. Right, and it's the same a field of view. It's about 100 degrees, maybe 110. Uh, and that looks as you expect it to look, which is pretty standard for VR right now. But in the center of that display, they have augmented a second display, mm -hmm. which is 19, which is a uh, 1080p, 1920 by 1080 pixels, just in the center of this rectangle with this soft edge to it, and they, the two panels blend uh, almost seamlessly. So their expertise is not in panel making. These are relatively off-the-shelf parts, whether it's the background display. That's pretty good. You know the Vive Pro, pretty good. You can read text with that, but you yep. know you're looking at a display. You can no. still see some kind of screen door effect. And all the software compensates for that by making the text humongous. Exactly. But at the center of that, they have another off-the-shelf display, which is the pixel density of what you could call, you know, to use Apple's parlance, retina, where it, you cannot yes. see the individual sub-pixels, and you can't see the space between the pixels. They explained that if the entire field of view was at the same pixel density, you would have to render at 16K per eye. Per eye, that's the equivalent. And they talk about the density pixel in terms of pixels per degree. Mm. I think their headset's around 90, 95 degrees, 94 degrees field of view um, total. And so in each degree, it's about 60 pixels in that small postage, size, uh, postage stamp size area. Yeah, so when I first put on this headset, I expected to see something interesting, but I was truly impressed. I mean, I was saying, wow, oh my God. I was seeing, I could see a uh, eye chart that you're supposed to use to test your eyesight at the proper distance and at the proper size, and I could read beyond 2020. Yeah, truly impressive. Unfortunately, one of those things that you can watch the video, you'll see the samples that we took, but unless you're actually putting the headset on experiencing, yeah. it's tough to convey the difference in experience and image quality. We tried to do that in our conversation with their CEO, so let's check that out. Hey, I'm chatting with Orha from Vario. Now, Vario makes this, a new headset that has a display technology unlike anything I've ever seen before. It combines uh, a wide field, low resolution display, I mean relatively low, with a high resolution center. Is that a good d brief description? It is, it is, yeah. So we call it the foveating display system. We call it bionic display because it's inspired by the, how the human eye works and how we work as humans. So we are looking at one thing at a time, concentrating on that one, and we work on what is in front of us. Right, so when, I, when my human eye focuses on, on an object, mm -hmm. uh, only a very little bit of actual material is in perfect focus. Yeah. Everything else is out of focus yes. because it's not the small amount of space that I'm focusing on. Yeah. And you've essentially done the same thing with the center of the display, so that whichever direction I'm looking in, that's mm. in a much finer amount of detail. Yeah, exactly. And so how have you done that? How have you created 
it's two different displays, right? You're not doing a single display and you're only doing high res in the center. Yeah. You're overlapping two displays. Yeah. How, yeah. how is that done? So uh, we basically, we were inspired by the idea that can we actually pull off a display that can do variable resolution? Because that's essentially what you need to do to be able to go to the full human eye resolution right. the fastest. So what we're doing is that we're combining in this unit a micro OLED from Sony that is running at over 3000 ppi with a normal glass OLED, in this case from AUO, uh, which is running at uh, a bit over 600 ppi. That yeah. gives you the wide field of view, yes. while the Sony gives you the uh, high precision where it needs to be, which is in front of you. But how much space is there between those two displays? They're not uh, on top of each other, so we are using uh, optical combination. We call it light fusion optics, where we're combining those two light paths together and showing to the user. Oh, interesting. So when I looked through it, it seemed like they were maybe on a different plane. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. something that is going to be refined a little bit further, or is that is that just inherent to when you're combining two displays that you have to... You mean on a different optical plane? Yes. So optically, um, uh, the manufacturer pieces will be on the act exact same huh. optical plane. Yeah. Wow. So when I looked through the, the world, uh, I could look in a cockpit, for instance, mm -hmm. and I saw mm -hmm. all of the instrumentation, and I could read the display is as if it was real life. You, you have an eye chart in there yes. with the 2020 vision, yeah. and I'm standing, I assume, at the, yeah, at the distance. Yeah, distance is approximately right. It, the, you always have a slight variation with these tracking systems, but yeah. And I could actually read beyond 2020. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it is approximating human uh, resolution. Is that, yeah, is, is yeah. that, is that the goal? This is running at exact human eye resolution over 60 pixels per degree, full comfortable human eye resolution. Maybe some aerospace pilots could see some some smaller, finer detail, right. but they're better than we normally <laughs> So tell me, what kind of horsepower is required to render that uh -huh. resolution? So eh? that's the clever part, of course. Now, by doing this kind of uh, bionic display, we can run it on a laptop. This one is a, a GTX 1080 uh, Max-Q design, okay. running perfectly comfortably. But uh, GTX 1050 is the absolute minimum that has enough fill rate for these displays, right? Uh, of course, some of our customer base, they can easily be shelving like a million's worth of GPUs for each headset to be able to do some real-time ray tracing and cool stuff like that. But, right. uh, but that's, that's not, not the, the typical case. Right. No. And you don't need that one. It's only if you want to go to the absolute finest kind of qualities. Right. right? Now, the 1050 is not too far off from the Rift and the Vive. No, it's pretty much either. the same. So you're always basically having a, a time warping compositor that complements the mist frames and so forth. So the 1050 is the bare minimum to be able to run that one. And then that makes everything smooth, even if you're rendering at like 30 FPS. So is it going to be a trick for Unity developers, Unreal developers, to render their games that no. will take advantage of this? Because no. they need to render a higher resolution area, mm -hmm. but not the whole field of view. No, so we basically have a plugin. So all they need to do is import it, drag in the prefab done. So it's that easy. They don't need to care anything about the rendering at all. It's right. the same, same thing as for any of other VR headsets. They don't need to care. They don't have to think about it. No. Is it approximately the same field of view as mm -hmm. other headsets? Yeah, this is running 100. at... This is running at 90 degrees horizontal right. field of view. It's not quite as wide as, for example, HTC Vive, right. but it's perfectly immersive still. And tell yeah. me about the, the optics, the lenses themselves. Are you using a Fresnel lens? No, these are nice clean lenses. We used to be doing, uh, for the longest time, diamond turning, that, but now we have more moved into a... Uh, uh, custom molded lenses huh. for the plastic lenses, but then uh, still, of course, our glass lenses are grinded individually, so po and polished, of course. Yeah. And your refresh rate? Are you running at 90? These are running at 90 hertz. Yeah. Both of the displays, and, and they're in sync with one another. Yeah. So on this one, the focus displays are running at 60 hertz, while the background display is running at 90. And oh, okay. Yeah. We have been we have been running this also at the focus displays at 120. But we don't have the sync yet, so that's one of the things that we're working on to get the 90 hertz full sync to that one. That's interesting. I didn't notice a difference between mm -hmm. the two. Yeah, that, that's why we haven't been running it at 120, but we're running it at 60 until we have the sync, right? Right. Yeah. I wonder if I was playing a more action-packed game like a flight simulator or something where I was moving through space, if that becomes more apparent. Mm, could be, could be. Right. We but haven't been play playing games with this one yet, so right. can't tell. Um, so talking about the center display, if that's a different... Uh, product. If, if if the person that you source that display from makes a bigger display, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, would you consider? Is that how you're going to eventually get to a wider? Well, it's one of the parts. We have mm -hmm. many parts how to actually pull it off, and we're looking into the next generation devices already now. So, 
obviously that's one of the opportunities and you're seeing many in the OLED space for example working on the 2K 2K panels right really interesting opportunity for us and so forth so many opportunities that's one and let's see what we're actually going to be bringing to the market next year <laughs> I, I assume as you expand the size of that center panel it also there's a development budget there's a there's a power budget on the computer side, the rendering side, it's mm. going to take more horsepower. Yeah, so but then again, that, that also improves every course. year. So, so once you go one year ahead, the GPUs have almost twice the power and so forth. So, right. Eh, Very cool. It's fun. So you also have this amazing photogrammetry um, experiment that you guys did. Yeah, because so we don't have content which is high enough fidelity. That's one of the problems. We have been asking it from multiple directions. Sometimes we get it, but we cannot show those in public demonstrations, right. which is a shame. So we have been doing much of explorations, for example, how to do really high quality photogrammetry. Mm -hmm. And these scans were done in a couple of hours uh, and they are pretty much the most difficult kind of environments to do. So it's also a learning experience so that we can tell our customer base that if you want to capture your existing environment for training purposes, for example, yeah. this is how you do it and you will get absolutely phenomenal quality. It's real as life. Well, I wasn't just impressed by the texture resolution in the photogrammetry. Mm -hmm. I was impressed by the geometry capture. Yeah. Normally, the photogrammetry, it looks amorphous, and there are jaggies and strange things connecting the geometry. But this is really high resolution. Did, yeah. did, you, how did, did you guys capture this using SLRs, or what did you yeah, use? Yeah, we used uh, a 50 megapixel Canon SLR that also um, uh, is very aliased. Uh -huh. uh, which uh, uh, helps these uh, photogrammetry applications have like really good sharpness. So typically you have an uh, uh, anti-ALS filter on, on the SLRs and, and some, of, some of the uh, 5D models don't have that. So we have a, like a recommended spec for if you want to do the best possible quality. Right, it's right? oh, really cool. And is that a tool set that you'll enable? We don't do that one. It's okay. reality capture. Oh, sure. So it's the, but they are doing phenomenal job. So it wasn't like more than a couple of years ago when I started doing uh, photogrammetry myself. And the leaves that has been happening on that domain in the past two years, phenomenal. Oh, thank you. I thought it was a 360 photo. And then <laughs> I moved around and it was yeah. volumetric. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a, a SteamVR 2.0 tracking yeah. embedded right now. And is that what you're planning to use going forward? Yeah, but one of the things that we're working on uh, with our customers is that many of them have OptiTrack, ART, Polhemos tracking systems. Yeah. So we are now building tools to make it so that it's very easy to use any other tracking system as well. Because you have different uh, systems for different purposes. Mm -hmm. But you want to make your own product? Is that right? Yeah. You want to sell this to consumers? Yeah, so we are absolutely a products company. So we were just calculating from the leadership team that we have shipped roughly two billion phones in our past, mm -hmm. and we have been like designing most of those phones that we have been shipping mm -hmm. as well. So it's it, uh, we are really passionate about making products ourselves. So, so when can our viewers expect to be able to get well, one of these products? Well, at the end of the year, we're putting these to sales. Okay. Our target audience is mainly enterprises, professionals. Uh, so uh, hopefully, of course, many of your customer base belongs into that segment and I do believe that that's going to be the case. So it's going to be at the end of the year. We still haven't announced the launch window, but it's going to be on the fourth quarter in any case. Okay, well, very exciting. I, I can't wait to, uh, for other people to see this because it, it really is almost a stopgap towards getting the entire field of view in high resolution yeah, that yeah. works with a laptop. Yeah, this is kind of like an engineer solution. So. You see a problem and you find the shortcut yeah. that uh, creates a good enough experience, good enough compromise, and that's what we have done in here. So it allows you to go to the end game of VR already today, uh, instead of needing to wait the scientific process to gradually iterate and converge in a five to 10 years time to the, uh, to the human eye resolution. Well, nice work. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Oh, thanks. So let's first clarify how they're doing this, at least how we understand yes. that they're making this headset. In fact, I, it took me a while to wrap my head around this, and you, you had to step me through it. And it's an interesting comparison to an augmented reality headset, your traditional augmented reality headsets, the way that they're combining these two images. Right. They're not stacking one panel on top of another. Exactly, right. They're not literally stacking a panel and another panel right. and somehow blending them. With many augmented reality headsets, not talking about the, the HoloLens or not talking about uh, 
um, Magic Leap because they use a special type of optics. But most common off-the-shelf augmented reality setups have what's called a combiner. You have a display that's usually offset from your eye. In the Meta headset, for example, displays above your eye, like mm -hmm. an LCD panel. It just even like in the Lenovo Star Wars augmented, augmented reality experience, it is your phone above your eye. And you're seeing a reflection of that, but it's like a mirror that you can see through as well. It's a one-way mirror. So that image gets reflected into your eye. That's called the combiner, but it combines images from the outside world because the light can also pass through the back of it. Yes, it's a little bit dimmed. Uh, you may have to use some polarization to get that so you can for everything to work there, mm -hmm. but that's how the optics can be combined. Mm -hmm. Now, they're, in AR, that method of using combiners has some limitations. Sure. Because you have what we call the, the convergence um, accommodation mm -hmm. uh, conflict. The image that you see floating in the world is fixed at a, a certain point, mm -hmm. right? In space, usually in about the, the five or six feet area. Uh, while in the real world, of course, light comes at you at all sorts of distances. So I can put my hand up here and I can focus and, and accommodate here, but that floating augmented reality image is, feels disconnected yep. from, from that. If you're using a combiner though for two VR displays, that's not a problem. No, it's, very, it's a great convincing effect. So essentially they have the, the display is 90 degrees offset. You have one display in front of you and one display above it and you have that 90 degree mirror that, that reflects the top one and lays it on top of the other display, and it, which is essentially an effect that's, that's quite convincing. Now, now I won't say it's 100%, the actual layering seemed a little off, but as you saw in the interview, I asked about that, and they said that by the time they ship, that will be fixed. A lot of that has to do with the calibration. Mm -hmm. Like there are complicated optics to get that postage charge stamp, which I think are on the temples here, it, it was superimposed. Yeah. It looking flat, I don't think is a problem, but alignment, color, refresh rate. The pixel alignment was great. Yeah. I mean, it, you couldn't even really tell. Now, now, granted, the center display does this uh, vignetting where a surrounding it, it sort of blends into the mm -hmm. surrounding display. Mm -hmm. And I imagine when they're calibrating it, they have that turned off right. because they want to see those pixels transition precisely from yeah. one display to the other. But the vignetting just softens it even more and makes it even more invisible. And they can adjust that frame any size. What we saw was a, a rounded edge mm -hmm. frame, which is, is a natural frame, but that they could make it a hard edge frame if they want. And in some instances, they want, like you said, for calibration purposes, or in some purposes where you, you just need to know where in the center, right. where it's highly focused, and maximize all those pixels, and you don't care about the seamless blend, you just want the pixels. Have that hard edge frame, no problem. Now, now the experience of seeing these sharp images is really unlike anything I, I've ever seen. Way beyond the Vive Pro. I mean, beyond what I would expect from current technology. And they were running off a laptop. So rendering is other thing. Well, how, how does it tax? How much does your Unity renderer have to compensate? Yeah. And they said it was you know a simple plug-in where you tell the renderer that you're drawing four boxes as opposed to two boxes. And the background boxes will be at a certain resolution. Mm -hmm. And then your foreground boxes, foreground just meaning the smaller, smaller, higher density one, they're only gonna render what's in that pixel, mm -hmm. in that space. Now they so did say a fraction of that. They did say that OpenVR, the, the Valve standard that they employ on Steam OS or on the on the for the Vive when they first released it, uh, does not support this. It doesn't support these multiple renderings. So you have to use their uh, developer kit, if you use their plugin and their mm -hmm. rendering pipeline. Right. But they said it really only took a, t a couple days tops for developers to port their apps over to use this. But that is to say, it doesn't work out of the box with everything already. And speaking of Valve, you know they're not developing, Vario isn't developing their own tracking solution. They were using Steam uh, Tracking 2.0 right. uh, beacons, lighthouses, uh, for the demo setup we were using. So they're focused on making a headset. It is a corded headset. It will be tied to a laptop or tied to a PC. I would expect so. That's fine for the rendering power. Um, but it really is, their specialty is in combining those displays mm -hmm. and aligning them in the software. They described it you know, as it's their engineer solution, right? They weren't trying to solve the complete right. field of view so problem. So we have this much processing power to work with. We have these capable capabilities. These uh, off-the-shelf displays. Let's find a way to combine them. How could we make it work? How yeah. do we make a solution that works? And, and this is not the end solution. Like no. The end solution is the 16K per eye. I'm sure it is. You know, Eventually, we'll get there one way or another. But this works now. Now, the very first prototype they had shown of this type of small headset and this, uh, this focus, retina-style uh, focus display mm -hmm. uh, was even smaller. They'd have already swapped out a second part, so it tells me that at some, to some point it's scalable. 
Mm -hmm. They can get as, I think Sony is their uh, supplier for this. For the 10, center panel? Yeah, center panel. If they get a panel that's 4K, mm -hmm. but maybe an inch bigger, right? And have that trade off between pixel density yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and impose that, they can still make that work with this style of display, with this style of combiner. Uh, the headset may be bigger, maybe the form factor may change a little bit, sure. but it's scalable and it is one path to getting essentially locked-in foveated it rendering. It is locked-in, that's a good, good way to put it. What do you think about that experience of having to look, actually move your head, not simply your eyes, yeah. in order to see the higher focus of whatever it is you're looking at? It, it doesn't feel natural, mm -hmm. but I got used to it very quickly. Understanding that you know, it was like I was holding a blurring mask around my real field of view, <laughs> right. and the only whole yeah. to see the real to see the the resolution of the, the real world was in the center and i would it, love that hole to grow but the blurring is still the resolution of of this guy in, here in a sense we're already doing that right because the center of our lenses is where that sweet spot is yeah and so right. we're already turning our heads to get the most focus that we can mm -hmm. this is just an extension of that and yeah. it really is powerful we, we browsed a, a gallery of artwork and when you compare the before and after shots, it's, it's just like you're, you're seeing it as if you're really there. And we were comparing before and after shots by moving our head, like moving it off the edge exactly. of, of that frame. Um, and yeah, it is night and day. Uh, photogrammetry scenes look incredible. They actually did a really great photogrammetry experiment themselves, which just using off the shelf software, but like this definitely made that next level. Looking at HUD displays in an airplane, mm -hmm. you know, just seeing that you can use actual game assets that don't have to be jumbo sized in order yeah. to be usable or readable inside right. of VR, that's, that's the taste of the future and I'm really excited by that. But it also makes me totally understand why they're going for the professional environment. Because you know, it's expensive? It's gonna be probably gonna be very expensive <laughs> and also for it not gonna be for games. It's gonna be for people who are working in CAD and Why VR. not for games? It would be great for games. Because the games, you have to design the game where you don't need to dart your eyes around. I, I disagree. I think if you were to play any game with this, whether it's Beat Saber or whether it's you know Echo Arena or a flight game, this would be fantastic. Wow. I just I I'm afraid that it is going to be so expensive, and it's yeah. that there's going to be so few out there that it won't necessitate the developers taking those two days to incorporate the pipeline into their work. Sure. And we're not going to see support for a whole lot of games until this does come down to the consumers. Now we also saw an AR implementation of this Vario headset. It's an attachment to that same prototype that has two wide angle cameras and allows for stereoscopic pass through at 90 hertz yeah. video. With a little bit of a delay, they say 40 milliseconds is their latency right now. They want to get it in the single digits, but it was an effective AR pass-through system. It's, it's actually kind of ingenious because there are problems with the, with the AR headsets that we've seen, which is to say that you got this image that's augmented onto reality, but reality extends beyond it. So there's always this illusion that's broken as soon as the augmented object hits the edge of that display. Right. Um, with, this, with their solution, they control exactly what you see. You're seeing essentially a virtual reality amount of a uh, field of view, and they can augment whatever they want within that. Yeah, they had a motorcycle in the hotel suite that we were uh, using this in, and it was just floating there. Yeah. Now, they don't do any slam, no inside out depth mapping. Yes, yes. Right? they kept saying not yet. Yeah, so that's gonna be an essential part to make AR effective, otherwise everything's gonna be mapped to the background. Right. And, and you don't have an interaction with your virtual object. They, and they talked a little bit about syncing up and so the, the, the latency between the augmented stuff and mm -hmm. actual reality. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, you know, you don't ever want to slow down the reality feed. You want that video to be as realistic as possible. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, well, you can tweak it a little bit yeah. if it's in favor of actually getting nice sync between the augmented and the reality. I love that this company is doing this. It is something I couldn't imagine a Microsoft, a Google, or a Facebook Oculus ever doing because it doesn't read as a seamless consumer experience. Someone uninformed <laughs> about VR putting this on is gonna feel like it's broken. But for huh. us, it's like, it's the bootstrapping of technologies yeah. to make it work. In that sense, it does feel very much like six years ago in those VR forum days when people are just hacking together headsets and technologies mm -hmm. based on what's available now. They, well, I can't wait to see what the price is because yeah. it, saying that they're gonna go for pro, does that mean Vive Pro levels, like around maybe $1,000? I think it's gonna be more. Or is it more? Like, that's my concern. I, I can't wait to find out. They say we're gonna find out later this year. 
One more thing before we let you guys go. There's a new game coming out that you got to play, Jeremy. Well, it's an add-on to an existing game, one of our favorite games in VR, Echo Arena. That's right. Well, the whole Lone Echo, Echo Arena thing is something we've talked a lot about. Um, Echo Arena is the free, what do you call it, disc soccer? Yeah. It's a 3v3 soccer game, essentially, with the disc game. It's zero G. It's got a locomotion mechanic that I believe is the high bar in terms of immersion and no nausea. Uh, and so they, we knew they were working on Echo Combat, they had their first closed beta uh, on this past Saturday, and I was very fortunate in order to play. So I can give you a quick rundown on that. Um, it is basically the same locomotion mechanic, but with guns, which <laughs> is just what I wanted as soon as I played Echo Arena for the first time. So I'm glad that's an option. And it's going to be added into Echo Arena so that if you join that game, you go to the lobby, you choose which room you want to go into. You play whichever one you want. So I assume 3v3 still. It is. But not the same arena. Totally different arena, different entirely. It's much bigger. Uh, and it is, it is a uh, escort mission. That's the mode that we've seen in this beta. Who knows what other modes there will be. I'm hoping that there'll just be a deathmatch mode because sure. why not? Um, but it is, you spawn as attackers or defenders. Uh, the, you know, the defenders fly out into the arena. They have about a minute to place themselves. And then the buzzer sounds and the, uh, the attackers proceed to try to escort the flamingo. Why not? The minecart. Apparently, the VR. they experimented with shapes and sci-fi things, and one of their artists made a flamingo. And it worked. And it just, <laughs> they, they bought it, and they loved it. So that, that's what it is. You're escorting this sci-fi flamingo, and if you touch it, it starts to move. And if more of your team are on it, it moves a little bit faster. Grabbing it. Now, the weapons that you have. People were joining saying, which, which class should I be? It's not quite class-based. Like, you don't just choose a character or anything like that. There's three weapons right now, guns, that you can choose from. Uh, there's like a machine gun, there's a shotgun, and there's a sniper rifle. Um, all three of them pretty much look the same. There's a gun that comes out of your right hand that's permanently attached. You cannot drop the weapon. You don't pick up weapons. It's just an uh, infinite ammo recharging weapon. You choose which one you want when you spawn, and out you go, and you have that in your hand. Does that mean you can't grab with the right hand? Uh, you hold on to things. That's because oh, you, you have the two okay. triggers, it, right? Yeah. You have the lower one and the, the top one. The animation still lets you grab. That's totally still the, the locomotion. That has not changed at all. Got it. The only thing that's changed, and you can also still grab on the characters, there's no punching yeah. uh, and there's no defense as there was in Echo Arena. Um, so that's your primary weapon. The secondary weapon, they only had two of three that were in the game. Uh, that was the, what they call attack mod. Uh, and that is uh, seeing through walls and also a, a heal. Mm. Where you heal, you put out a sphere and you heal your teammates. Oh, very cool. Uh, so you decide among yourselves who's going to have which tack mod before you spawn, and uh, it's a cooldown essentially. So that once you use it, you pop it. Uh, it happens, and then you have to wait a minute or so for it to spawn up again. There's also ordnance, so you, you have uh, grenades on your back, zero G grenades, of course. You grab it just as you would a shield in Space Pirate Trainer, and you've got it. And you throw it out into the world, and uh, you fire it with your, with your gun trigger, so you can't shoot while that's out there. Right? Oh, it would be cool if they made you shoot it. That would be interesting. Right? Well, there's another attack mod. Uh, there's another ordinance coming. So we'll see. We don't know what what that is. Same with the attack mod. There's another one of those coming. They're just question marks right now. Now, one of the things I love when playing Echo Arena was because of how well you can per per move yourself. You yeah. can hide your body, yeah. your physical form in that zero G space. I feel like that would work really well in a close quarter combat dodging and shooting environment. It's a ton of fun. I'll tell you, it absolutely is. But that, but the weird thing about that is their IK that they have, where your body is floating behind you and it's not right. where your feet are. Right. Um, you know, your hands and head are exactly where you expect them to be, but you don't always know where your foot is. Hitboxes. If yeah. your foot is hanging out a corner and you don't expect it to be, it's going to get sniped, oh. right? Because the player is not, they don't have to be at you as they do in Echo Arena to get you. So there's an, some element of, I think I'm hitting people and they don't know it. And then they'll start, they'll realize they're being hit and they'll just fly away. Like, they can, get me out of here. And you hear a little bing, bing, bing whenever you hit somebody. Nice. So that, that's an interesting element. It's just going to be a matter of learning the maps and learning where you can hide and from which angles. Uh, it's a ton of fun. The difficulty level was all over the map based on the uh, skill level, the people you were playing. Mm -hmm. We had games where we just trounced them and, and we were uh, escorted almost without any resistance. Wow. And we had games where we couldn't even get out of the launch box. You know, So th there's a huge curve of, of mastery, I think, in this game. 
for both sides of this equation. That, and that, strategy. That's what I mean. Yeah. So working together as a team, learning if you die to wait for your team, learning you know when to trigger your attack mods, things like that. There's quite a lot of skill to be learned from this. And the day after this beta was over, I just I just wanted to get back in and, and try to master that a little bit more. Well, also in your own base, your lobby, you see a miniature representation of the entire map too. So you can plan with your teammates. You know where the enemy is going to be. Yeah. And so you can say, okay, that person's hiding behind there. Let's all attack from the right and pop kill that one person and then be a three on two. It's an interesting mechanic because unlike Echo Arena where you're both spawning at the same time, the uh, the attackers, the people who are trying to escort, they have a, a minute while the other team is taking position. And yeah. you, you actually get to see them in that miniature fly through it and uh, you know you can sort of get a bead on their strategy. Right, right. Same thing when you spawn. When you respawn, you can take a look, make sure everyone's where they're supposed to be or see if you should wait or if, if everyone's dead or not. Do you um, feel like this yeah. game, I mean, we've only played it for the, the closed beta, mm -hmm. but you feel like we need more players? 3v3, is that going to be enough? You know, I, I'm not a good judge of that because, like I said, there, the difficulty was all over the map as it is. I think 3v3 is enough, as long mm -hmm. as you can be coordinated. Uh, I know Echo Arena added a, like a 5v5 mode. I wouldn't be surprised if we see things like that. Um, or even, I don't know if 1v1 is going to work too well, but a deathmatch would. Like, yeah. if there's other modes that certainly lend themselves to that, Oh man, I'd love to play a capture the flag or something like that in this. I'm so surprised that there isn't type of class system because mm -hmm. with zero G, you can change the mass. You can make people move slower through space. Right. Right. Have require more. You know, speed can be a, a big factor. And in fact, they do that with the disc in Echo Arena. If you're carrying the disc, you can't go very fast. Right. Um, yeah. No, you're right. There's there's a just having weapons in that zero G environment is a lot of fun, but it certainly makes your mind work about what what more could they do with this basic set of tools. Mm. I wonder which of these two game modes is going to be the new user-friendly, the new newbie mode. Like, if you dive into this, are you going to play the weird frisbee game or are you going to play the game with guns? You'll probably play Echo Combat. Yeah. Um, and I would say that there's just as much skill to both of them, but Echo Arena probably does require a little more finesse. Throwing things is a lot harder than looking down your sights and pulling a trigger. Right. And I'm sure they're going to be announcing more about this at E3 mm -hmm. next week. Yep. And uh, while you had the closed beta, there's going to be open beta? On June 21st, that's when it's currently slated. So anybody's going to be able to join that. And then hopefully the final release won't be too far behind. Oh, so very excited. Can't wait to see everyone in Echo Combat. And thank you all for watching. We're going to be E3 next week. We have more stuff from Augmented World Expo in future episodes. So until next time, we'll see you then. Bye.